Uh, each week, as we worship together as a community, we come to God's Word because God's Word is where we hear the story that leads us to Jesus. God's Word is where we find the truth that helps us see and navigate the world according to God's eyes versus the way that we see it. And so each week, we need a refresh, we read refreshing. Um, but if this is the only meal of God's Word that you eat this week, you're going to starve throughout the rest of the week, right? So I encourage you to let this be a tipping point, a, a starting point, a beginning to your study of God's Word for your t- time in God's Word throughout the week. You can turn in your Bibles if you, if you have them on, uh, on your phone, that's fine. Or if you have them uh, kind of a hard copy with you, I'll go, I'll go ahead and turn over to Daniel chapter 7. As you're going over there, um, I just had a quick shout out that I wanted to do. Uh, yesterday we had a team of uh, volunteers and of, of people come over to the church and do some cleaning. And uh, it, it made a big difference. The outside looks really good. There's some nice mulch. So if you want to go outside afterwards and just stick your face in the mulch and smell it, it smells really good. <laughs> if you want to try going down the slide outside, go for it. It's, uh, it's really nice out there. Um, and at one point in the cleaning day, I was uh, working with my, my son Tozer, and he was given the job. Um, I didn't give him the job, but he was given the job of uh, watering the plants. And uh, my, my son is about two. Um, so it was going to be a messy, messy job, but it was, he was having fun with it. And we were trying to get the, ho- the nozzle attached to the hose, and the, the hose was a little bit bent, so no matter how tight we got it, there was water spraying back and, and getting everybody all messy. You know, so I was all wet, he was all wet. And we had to decide, are we going to keep watering the plants with this leaking water, or do we, um, you, you know, just wait for another time? We decided to keep doing it because the water that did get through was going to be, still be good for the plants, right? He'd get a little messy, it'd dry off. Um, some water would get through, though not everything. And I was thinking about that this morning as we get ready for Daniel 7. And it kind of, it illustrates to me what the, our expectations need to be for this morning. Because as we look at Daniel 7, there's no way we're going to get everything out of this. It's just not going to happen. There's going to be, there's going to be water left on the, on the page, if you will, or there's going to be, there's going to be leftovers that I don't touch on. Um, and it's going to be messy because as one commentator put it, there's no Old Testament passage that's talked about as much as Daniel 7. Okay. Lots of people see this and look at it and dig into it. Um, and there's pretty different opinions about this. And so I might say something, uh, or perhaps I won't say something um, that you think is really important. And that's okay, because we have a choice. We can either say it's too messy and set it off for another time, or we can do it anyways, because the Word of God is going to nourish our souls. Spending time in it is going to nourish our souls. And even if it's messy, even if we don't get all of what we need out of it, there's an invitation there to come back and water ourselves the next day with Daniel 7, to go read a a commentary on it, to go spend time tomorrow in it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to keep going. So today, we're going to come to Daniel 7. We're going to look at it, be fed by God's word. Will you pray with me? Spirit, we invite you to speak this morning. I ask that whatever I have prepared, that you would control, that you would speak your words out of your scripture, and that would be what we walk away with. Lord, we come to you humbly. We ask that obstacles and barriers, whatever they might look like, whether we be bringing them from last week or they be presuppositions that we have or whether they be um, concerns or whatever it is, anxieties, that we would be bringing into this moment, that we would surrender them to you. And we'd be ready to learn, that we'd be teachable before you. Lord, we thank you for the promises that we're going to see this morning. We thank you that you are in control, that this is your world. I ask that you would be glorified this morning as we proclaim your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. Um, I'll have it up on here if you want to follow along there or follow along in your Bibles. In the very first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. He wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. 
Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four great beasts came out, up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off. It was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this, first, excuse me, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. In the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. We'll pause there. So this, this dream is presented to us in Daniel chapter 7. And if we jump to a few verses over to verse 15, we'd get to see uh, Daniel's reaction. Um, he's alarmed. He actually has anxiety over the dream. It's a, it's a disturbing nightmare of a vision to him. And to you and to me, if you've been following along in the, the study of Daniel, um, or if you're just familiar from your own personal studies in the book of Daniel, you know that this sequence of four different um, uh, beasts or this sequence of four has happened before. In, in Daniel chapter 2, there was a different dream, a different a uh, dream given to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in it, there was a segment of four divided up. In that one, there was a statue and the four different pieces. And so it's easy for us to draw a connection and be like, oh, so this is the, probably the same type of thing. This is the same thing that's happening here. No need to be alarmed because we know how that story ended. It ended with the kingdom of God coming in and taking over and, and destroying the former ones and you know, God's people having a, a hope. But for Daniel, this is decades that have gone by. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's been gone for a while now. This is the first year of Belshazzar. And under Belshazzar, Daniel didn't have the same stability, the same uh, influence that he had under Nebuchadnezzar. It's been a long time since he's heard that dream and the interpretation. And on the face of it, this dream is pretty different. Right? Like the former dream, the imagery was like this regal statue that represented the different uh, kings and kingdoms. And in this dream, it's monstrous, deformed beasts. It's these weird amalgamations and mixtures of different kinds of animals. It's, it's weird. But the interpretation is still the same. In Daniel 7, verse 17, we read, that these four great beasts are four kings who will arise out of the earth. Just like the four different metals in the statue were four kingdoms that would arise. So we can say that much with absolute certainty because the Bible tells us. And the point that I want to make after looking and reading scripture here is that what we see in this story is that dominion, authority, 
the ruling um, responsibility is given to these terrifying beasts. And pause on that thought for just a second. Um, I'm not making a political statement in this, but do you ever feel like in our political climate, not maybe this, whether it be this presidential segment or the last presidential segment, that it feels like there's crazy beasts in charge? Yes. Does it ever feel like chaos? The other day, the other day I saw a bumper sticker. And it said, um, I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I'm an American. I want my country back. And the idea being that these ideologies or these, these, these quests for power and control distort things and destroy things. They rip things apart. And we kind of are in this place where like, I really wish that instead of these terrifying beasts being in charge, wouldn't it be nice if there was like a very noble king sitting on the throne, followed by an even more noble king who is surpassed by an even greater king who rules with wisdom and justice? But dominion hasn't been given to people like that. Dominion, for now, has been given to beasts. And our expectation out of our governments is set in Daniel 7. And there's a, there's a component of this because it's the same set of four that, that came before. It's, it's echoed, it's repeated, it's, we're, we're drawn into this. And, and as the book of Daniel continues, we're going to see um, specific events being linked to uh, these images and these dreams, there's a component of control over the history that's taking place. That as Babylon rises, kingdom number one, it's according to the will of God. And however beastly it is, is ordained by God, is under his control. And following Babylon is going to rise the Medo-Persian Empire. And however beastly it is, it's ordained by God. It's under his control, and it's for the time that he gives it. And following that is going to come the Greek, <laughs> sorry, space for a second, the Greek empire, and it's going to be beastly. But however long it's there is according to the will of God, under the control of God, followed by Rome, and followed by this blasphemous horn. And Daniel is linking the, 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 his points in chapters 1 through 6 to what's coming in chapters 8 through 12. And Daniel 7 is sitting right in the middle here. And it's saying everything that we've learned in the stories of da Daniel's chapter 1 through 6, that the Most High God is the one who rules. It's not Nebuchadnezzar. It's not Belshazzar. It's not Darius. The Most High God rules. And he appoints the kings. And he chooses them. That premise is linked in Daniel 7 to what's coming. That the people who are going to rule are going to be evil powers. But it's only for a time. It will continue until the kingdom of God is established. Until God himself comes and reigns. So Daniel 7 forms this bridge where we see in it not simply the image of these beasts terrorizing the world, but we also see an image as our, as our eyes sort of snap away from the earthly to the heavenly, we see an image of the Ancient of Days seated on the throne. He's not contested. There's no one challenging him. He's simply seated there. And it's telling us that this dominion that the kingdoms have for a time is something that is given to them, not something that they seized by themselves, not something that is out of control. And you and I, I, I don't know if this is necessarily in the text, so take this for what it's worth, but you and I ha uh, might have a tendency that as we see the chaos that these different kingdoms cause, 
to snap our heads to heaven with an accusation. You know, we, we, we see the earth and we turn our heads to heaven and we say, how could you be in charge, God, and let this happen? How in the world could you allow this? And so our minds shift to view the heavenly realm and the throne with this accusation. And to that, what we see is the vision of Daniel, I think. That the Ancient of Days is seated on his fiery throne, clothed in white. And none of our accusations land. None of our accusations soil his pure white garment. He is righteous and just in his reign and in his rule, even when that means giving dominion to beast-like emperors or kings or government officials. What's more, his hair is white, a symbol of wisdom, which means that we can trust that he is not working evil out for evil's sake, that he is not making a, a misstep in what he is doing with the histories of the world, but it is working out in the perfect way that he has planned. And we see him clothed in fire, enthroned in fire, perhaps is the better way of saying that. And I, have to, I had to laugh a little bit as I was thinking through this imagery, because when I think of a fiery throne in the cosmic battle between good and evil, I don't normally give the fiery throne to God, right? I, I mean, maybe, maybe you do, but typically I assign the fiery throne to the devil. I mean, like he's raining on fire and whatever, and then God is pure light or something like that. But throughout scripture, over and over again, fire is this picture of judgment, it's this picture of the, the, um, the consuming holiness. So an equitable judgment against evil. And it's not the devil who sits on that throne. It's the ancient of days. And what we end up seeing in the story is that while the ancient of days can sit on a fiery throne and it doesn't even touch him, as soon as that fiery judgment is brought to the beast, it's destroyed. Because dominion is given to them and it will be taken away. Well, Daniel's vision continues. He continues, and um, we keep reading. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. The visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints or the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. So as this dream continues, there's a, there's a new character on the stage who takes, who takes the limelight. He's not the beasts. It's the Son of Man. Um, and so crowd poll, if I say that the Son of Man receives the kingdom, who comes to mind? Christ. Jesus Christ. And that, that, that makes sense. We're, we're New Testament believers. But if you could set aside for a second all of like, that immediate reaction, and if you just look into Daniel 7, who is the one who receives the kingdom? I'm going to let you guys figure this one out and then tell me. You get to preach to me. Who is it? Not the Ancient of Days. That was good. good. It was a good... <laughs> the saints. It's the holy ones of God who receive the kingdom at the end of the story. And I think it's not a stretch for us to say that the minion is given to us. That phrase, holy ones, um, 
Uh, everywhere you go in this text, you're going to find different understandings of what any particular word means, okay? So that's just like a giant qualifier for everything I say. But that word holy ones um, refers to the idea of being set apart, of being sacred, of being assigned a purpose by God. And as you, as you look at the story of Daniel and you see what happens to the holy ones in later sections of the scripture, what you see is a group of people who are a set apart, who are protected, who are held by God as they are oppressed and rejected by the world around them. And I think to Daniel's readers, they would have read this and they would have said, that's us. And the promise of Daniel 7 is that it will not be forever that the beasts reign and rule over you and oppress you and persecute you and exile you. But because the Most High, the Ancient of Days, is seated on the throne and because he has called you out and he knows you by name, he's going to preserve you through the beasts and bring you to the kingdom on the other side. And there's hope being offered to the people who are oppressed. And I think that's worth camping out on because my tendency, um, as I think about the gospel, is to think about the here and now implications of the gospel. That today, I don't have to live in anxiety because I have been called a son of God. Today, I don't have to live up to a standard of works that I could never meet. Because Jesus has been my perfect righteousness and he's shared that with me. I don't have to be afraid of judgment today because my judgment landed on the cross. And I think about these elements and I tell myself this gospel today about the blessings of the gospel today and all those things are necessary and good. But I often forget to tell myself about the future. I often forget to um, teach myself the promises of a future blessed place that I'm going to with my Savior. And the story of Daniel is you can choose. You can choose to join the beasts in their temporary kingdom, in their temporary um, exercise of dominion and authority, or you can choose to join the people of God in their delayed dominion, in their delayed authority, but theirs lasts forever, forever and ever. Their state of blessedness is not for a period of time that will pass on to the next kingdom and then will pass on to the next kingdom and will be taken away from them. Their period of blessedness is off in the future. So, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious, which I think you should choose. I think it's obvious what Daniel wants us, where Daniel wants us to align ourselves. We want to be with the Son of Man. We want to be with the Holy Ones of God. And that means facing the beasts today. But, like that question earlier, when we think of the Son of Man, we do think of Jesus, don't we? There's a reason for that, of course. Um, it's because we're New Testament Christians. We're New Testament believers. We are only saints. We are only Holy Ones because we have been brought in through Jesus. And so when we look at the Gospels, nearly 80 times, Jesus uses the phrase son of man to talk about himself, not to talk about the people of God. And interestingly enough, that doesn't cause any sort of ruckus uh, in the sense of people stepping up to Jesus and saying, whoa, 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 wait, the son of man, you're not the son of man, that's Israel. That's God's chosen people. That's the saints. There's no conversation between Jesus and the teachers that happens there because even um, without the New Testament, when you start examining the whole of Scripture's witness, you realize the necessity of a Messiah, of a king, that God has promised that the people of God will have an anointed, holy, chosen king who leads them into the place where they receive this kingdom. And so when you reconcile the Son of Man in Daniel 7 with Psalm 2, and the promise of the son of David, the Lord who will come. Or you reconcile it with the book of Isaiah and the servant. Or you reconcile it with Zechariah, the king and the priest. When you reconcile all this together, you do see that the son of man is a Messiah, a 
a Christ, a king, who will lead God's people into right relationship with God, into this blessed state where the kingdom comes to them instead of them being oppressed moving forward. Israel got a hold of that, and they missed Jesus. Because they were weaving these prophecies together and thinking that the Messiah was going to lead them as the saints into this blessed place. And they were understanding saints, I, I, I believe they're understanding it predominantly along the lines of we are separated as the called out ones of God culturally and through our rituals that God has given us. And he said, you're my people. And he's given us all these reasons to why, all these ways to show that, all these ways to demonstrate that you are my chosen people. You're holy to me. But everybody else, um, they weren't chosen. And they were missing the deeper reality of that called out element that Moses said, it's not enough to, to circumcise yourselves, you need to circumcise your hearts. You need to deal with the uncleanness inside your heart. You need to do with the, deal with the unholiness inside your heart if you're going to be my people, my holy saints. The problem is nobody ever does that. The Old Testament illustrates this, and Jesus in Matthew 5 gets on board with helping deepen the understanding of this, that the Messiah has no holy people to lead. He has no saints to lead into glory. Because we all have this beast-like attitude inside of our hearts, this corrupted, not human, any longer, not bearing the image of God inside any longer. But instead, we try to make ourselves king. We we use our own system of morality rather than God's standards, and we put ourselves at the center of the world. And so the Messiah's role, as we look at the fulfillments that Jesus provides to us in the Gospels, the Messiah's role is not simply to lead the saints, but it's to make us saints. It's to form the people of God, form the holy ones of God. And we see that tension, I think, being developed in John 12, So it starts off, he's talking about, he's explaining this role of the Son of Man, this Messiah. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. Well, that sounds straight out of Daniel 7, doesn't it? The beast being burned up in fire. And he's talking about what the Son of Man's going to do. And so everybody's tracking with him. Yes, absolutely. And he continues, and I, I'm the Son of Man, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, Well, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? The ministry and the work of the Messiah was going to be to receive the the fiery judgment that the people deserved. It was going to be to be hung on a cross so that God's people's unholiness could be dealt with so they could be cleansed. And as he overcame that judgment to give them a new life so that they could truly claim the title holy ones and saints. So it's not simply that the Messiah comes in and leads us into this place where we receive the kingdom that we've deserved all along. But the Messiah, the Son of Man, comes in and unites himself to us. And his very holiness becomes our holiness. And we as the people of God receive the kingdom through him and only if we are united to him. So walking away from this this morning, I have three things that I'd like like us to, to take away as applications. And the first one is I think Daniel 7 calls us to keep calm and carry on. The, the readers who, who received Daniel were exiles living under the judgment, living under either the reign of the, the bear or living under the reign of the lion eagle, these beasts. They didn't have power. They didn't have control. They didn't have authority. They were persecuted. And for you and for me, we experience some level of that today. Um, 
But for our brothers and sisters around the world, they probably experienced far more of it. And there may be a time coming where we experience far more of it. And as that happens, as we become discontent with the contorted, uh, even perhaps distorted, the contorted and distorted ways that governments will reign and rule in opposition and rebellion to God, as we are discontent with that, we are called to persevere in faithfulness like Daniel. Last week, that was the heart of Scott's message to us, that Daniel remained. He continued. He stayed faithful. And that example is what's given to us and what we're called to in Daniel 7. There are more beastly kingdoms coming. And we are called to endure and to persevere and to not lose hope, to stay the course. Second, linked to that, we're called to stay focused while we're reigning underneath these different kingdoms and be hopeful because the end of the story is actually very good. The end of the story should give us hope. And we're being invited to direct our attention out of our present day circumstance and into the wisdom of the long game and of eternity and to see that there is a future that's blessed. And so we're going to put our eggs in that basket And for the time that we're living here, we are on mission. Um, So I've been reading through Joshua, and one of the things that's hit me hard this week, uh, the conquest, where, you know, what was it like to be some Canaanite family and then have that home taken away from you? And then what was it like to be a Jewish family and walk into a furnished home with the decorations that belonged to the previous family? and the bedrooms that belong to the, their kids, and the, the food still in the cupboard, and to know that that was taken from them and given to you as an inheritance. And that was weight, that's weighty, that's sobering, right? And as we read Daniel 7, aren't we seeing something similar here? That the world belongs to beastly kingdoms right now, but a day is coming when it will be taken from them and given to God's people. That's sobering. But the difference, I think, between the conquest of the promised land and where you and I are at today, and this is glorious, is that you and I come from those peoples. You and I are already a part of the beastly kingdoms, and we've been welcomed out of that into the family of God. And we are now given the mission and the commission and the charge and the invitation to share with other people that you get to be a part of the family of God and receive the inheritance of God. We need to stay focused so that as many people could come along with us as possible. And then lastly, I would encourage you to worship the Lamb. Revelation 5, 11 through 12 says that John looks and he heard around the throne. So a similar vision is what Daniel had, seeing the throne of the ancient of days. And he listened and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? With one voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I love the fact that as our picture of these beasts concludes, we see the humanity of the Son of Man. And as the book of Bible concludes, we come back to a different type of beast who sits on the throne. Not a terrifying one, but a slain lamb. And because he is not the aggressive, he is not the blasphemous, because he is not the devouring, he is worshipped for all of eternity. And you and I get to join in that today. He was slain to give us life. And that sets him apart from any other king to receive the glory forever and forever. Let's pray.
Jesus, we desire to worship you all week long. We desire to live a life that draws other people into an, an enamored heart for you. That draw other people, that draw us ourselves into a place of profound thankfulness and worship. And Lord, we proclaim the gospel that your kingdom will endure forever. Now, there is one king, and his name is Jesus. And he has died to make us holy and righteous, to offer to us an eternal life, knowing you, not being separated from you anymore, but knowing you and living in your world. We praise you and we are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.